Wayne, welcome, mate. Thanks for having me on the program, Sean. And Thank you so much. For, have a chat. Thanks so much for uh, for joining us. Super, super, super excited to have you on. Um, I think you're doing some incredible work in the space of uh, of, of mental health, and um, we'll we'll go a little bit more into that a little bit later on. But first of all, we'll uh, give a bit of a, a brief rundown of yourself. Um, obviously, uh, AFL superstar, 282 games. Uh, North Melbourne and uh, and Sydney Swans, and New Zealand born. Um, so you, you've uh, you've come across the pond and and um, and picked up the game of AFL and and uh, you've had a pretty uh, pretty successful career in um, in the uh, in the AFL realm and and then on, onward into media and stuff like that as well. I still remember back in the day when I used to watch you on um, on the uh, after after AFL footy programs and catching up with country footy and uh, and all that sort of stuff as well. So you've had a, a great role in the media and continue to do so now. And, and obviously with your, um, with your organization, with the mental health, which is super exciting. I'm looking forward to, uh, to going into that, but for a bit of a brief rundown, mate, give us a bit of a, um, a bit of a, a spell on, on who you are, who is, who is Swatter? <laughs> Jeez. That's an interesting question, Sean. Um, who am I? I'm uh, a father of three kids, twin daughters, who have just turned 18. I've got a young son who's 14 and a half. Um, I played football at the elite level for a long period of time. Um, I've worked in corporate Australia. I'm a son. I'm a business owner, a passionate mental health advocate. I have a lived experience with mental health conditions. Um, I'm a partner. Um, I'm someone that um, doesn't really identify with his football uh, career anymore. It was a chapter written a long time ago. It's an experience that I'm incredibly proud of and grateful for, but it's not a reflection of who I am. It was, it was a part of my life back then. Um, I'm someone that is, I care greatly, Sean. Um, I care greatly about the people in my life, um, but also care greatly about my purpose in life, which is, to continue to invest my energies and efforts into um, advocating an increase in the awareness around mental health and emotional well-being, uh, but taking that a step further, which is what Pucker Up my organisation is doing in the next couple of months, and that is going beyond conversations and beginning to equip people with the knowledge, the confidence, the skill set and the toolbox, which ultimately allows and empowers people to look after their own well-being and mental health. And, and, and why I'm committed to doing that is because I believe suicide is preventable. But if we don't approach it in a fundamentally different way to what has been done historically in Australia, then we won't achieve a different outcome. Um, and that's why, um, you know, we partnered with Melbourne University, the Centre for Wellbeing Science and a technology partner called Elfie. Um, and we are about um, a month to two months away from launching a science-backed, evidence-based wellbeing program called Foundations of Wellbeing. This is a long-winded answer, but this is really who I am. I wake up every day um, wanting to be the best dad, the best partner, the best person, the best son, the best business owner, um, and someone who um, wakes up every day wanting to have a positive impact on the lives of other people, and a lot of those people we don't know. So... Um, I hope that that answers the question. That's that's a part of a large part of who I am. That's probably the best answer I've ever got. I reckon that was um, hugely in depth and and uh, raw and honest, which is which is just great and exactly what we want to hear. And um, I want to sort of jump straight into, you know, obviously sort of reversing back into your AFL career and then sort of obviously gets into you know what you've created now with Pucker Up. Um, and again, we'll sort of go a little bit more into Pucker Up a little bit later, but. Um, I do want to sort of talk about that infamous tweet, which is um, something that I actually do, I remember that was uh, pretty you know large in the media when you uh, when you did tweet it, and it got a lot of um, it got a lot of conversation started, which is obviously exactly what we want when it comes to mental health. And um, I'll uh, I'll read the tweet out here just for for anyone that hasn't seen the tweet. And basically, it's uh, it's you at the 1996 uh, grand final for North Melbourne. Um, which, you know, looking from the outside would be 
people's probably the, the, the ultimate dream to be standing up there, MCG, um, on the podium. You've just won a grand final. Um, and, you know, you, you look at that from the outside and that is the absolute ultimate. But you put a tweet up. Um, this is back in, uh, in 2017 of this photo. And, uh, and you put in the note there, this is what suicidal looks like. Fake smile, act happy, celebrating premiership success with North Melbourne Footy Club. Truth was incredibly suicidal, looking for my wife in the crowd because I wanted to end my life. Only two people knew in the crowd of 94,000 people, my wife and my GP, and then hashtag pucker up. And it's such a strong message. Um, you know, it, it almost sort of gives me uh, goosebumps just reading that out. But when you were, you know, writing that tweet out, what was um, what was your sort of purpose in that? Obviously, we can see now what it's what it's been able to create and that conversation that it was able to create. But what was your um, what was your intention and 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 what were you really really wanting to succeed? Putting that tweet out. Um, I, I it was an opportunity to rattle the cage in the sense that it was a really jarring post. I'm not on Twitter. I haven't been on Twitter for almost three years, Sean. So I've completely forgotten about that particular post mm -hmm. uh, until you've just mentioned it. But it was a very deliberate decision on my behalf because I think that there's an assumption made by people in our community that if you're high profile and you're a sports woman or sportsman and you're getting really well paid you're doing something that very few people might get the opportunity of doing or equally you could be a really uh, successful executive in a really big organization you could be a politician you could be an actor an actress but people that are often held in high regard and on pedestals pedestals people assume that they're naturally happy and I use that as an opportunity of challenging people's assumptions. You can be a mum and dad, you could be a butcher, a teacher, you could be a politician or a premiership, football, a premiership winning football player, and you could be suicidal. So I use that as an opportunity of really challenging the individual and collective psyche within um, the community to get people to think about money, material possessions, awards, premierships, don't equate to happiness. And you can be a high functioning, successful elite athlete, yet you can be still living with significant mental health conditions and be in the middle of a four year battle with suicidal ideation. Um, I, I, I don't regret the decision at all. Um, I've realized, uh, you know, quite a while ago, Sean, that I've got an opportunity to use the platforms available to me to challenge the way that we think about suicide. Um, and if I can use my experiences to create conversations, to get people to pause for a moment in a continuously scrolling world that we live in, to get people to sit back and reflect on their own mental health and emotional well-being, or reflect on the fact that they've lost people because of suicide, then I'm going to continue to do it. I do it today, um, you know, before we got on uh, and began this conversation. You know, I've been thinking a lot about the impact of lockdown, Sean, um, in relation to young people. Um, the Australian released an article yesterday um, in the 38 weeks so far of this year, we're averaging 148 hospital admissions from young people, teenagers who have either self-harmed self -harmed, or they're having thoughts of ending their life. That's 148 kids a week. It's 4,884 4, so far for this year. So that post four years ago is something that I won't apologise for because that's the reality of what we're dealing with. That's what I was dealing with. My story is no better or no worse. It's just my experience. But I think what's fundamentally different and why I choose to do these things, I think the fundamental difference, Sean, between what I've chosen to do and a lot of people who live with these conditions is I just choose to talk about it. I'm not afraid to talk about it. I won't, I won't allow myself not to talk about it because what the potential responses might be. Because the reality is, and you would know this as well as I do, 
There are so many people right now who are really struggling. There are so many people who are living with significant mental health conditions. And unfortunately, there's an increasing number of people who are on the verge of a crisis. And when you're in a crisis sort of headspace, one of the things that you think about, which I did for four years, was there's a permanent solution to this current situation. And that is you think about hurting yourselves. So I don't want people to make those decisions. So if I can share my experiences, but do it in a way that is challenge, constructively challenging, but also gives people the opportunity of thinking and then more importantly, coming into these discussions so that we can prevent people from hurting themselves and stop people from tragically taking their lives, then I'll, can do it, I'll, I'll continue to do this for the rest of my life. And that's the reason why I do it. I don't do this because I want people to like my posts. I don't, I don't do this because I want more people to follow me. I do this because I believe in the reason why we do it. Yeah, that's, that's, you can, you can definitely say that by your, uh, by your social media. And um, yeah, look, that, that tweet, you, you may have forgotten about it, but I was, you know, I was uh, Googling you, you know, throughout the week, just preparing for this and that popped up and I thought, oh, I've got to bring this up because it's so powerful. Um, and it, it, it's definitely um, something that is impactful and, and can make a difference. And someone that would be, you know, growing up, um, you know, whether it might be playing AFL or, or being someone in the limelight to see that um, would be, uh, would be encouraging for them to, to be able to feel a bit more, more comfortable talking up or, or going to seek help. Um, you know, within that, we've obviously seen over the last couple of years, a lot of AFL footy players or, um, or, you know, sportsmen, sportswomen that have uh, opened up about their mental health and, um, you know, obviously Tom Boyd in, in the past and, um, and a few Olympians in the last, you know, sort of three or four months. Uh, have you seen a bit of a, a shift since obviously when you were, when you were playing um, compared to now, a bit of a shift in that conversation being louder? Oh, there's, there's no doubt it's been a fundamental uh, shift. The fact that two males are on a conversation, a podcast recording, talking about the very topic that I hit for 12 years yeah. is another indication that we've shifted it. We need to shift it further and we need to do it quicker. That's the reality of this because there are an increasing number of people who are not coping. And that's okay to feel like you're not coping. That's not a criticism. Earlier this week, I sat down for a similar conversation with a boyhood hero of mine, Dermot Brer. Um, SEN have a dedicated show, Conversations That Could, with a dedicated sponsor. What does that really mean? It's a 24-hour sports station, but they've got a dedicated program with a dedicated sponsor to create content, create conversations similar to the one that we're having now. That's another sign. Are you okay, Dave? Um, your organisation, Pucker Up, um, Beyond Blue, um, Livin', there's, there's um, uh, Mates for Life. There, there are so many more organisations who are now actively working in this space. That is an indication that more people recognise the importance and the need and the urgency to do more in this space. But not wanting to dramatise this and not wanting to sensationalise it, the reality is... We in, in Australia, for three of the last four years, have lost more than 3,000 people to suicide in our beautiful country. Three of the last four years. 2019, 3,318 people tragically took their lives. On average, a further 65,500 people attempt the same outcome every year in Australia. Now, that would make it the fifth largest town in Victoria. So this is happening every year. And the issue that we're talking about, or I'm talking about, is not a male issue. It's not a female issue. It's a human being challenge. Men are, are tragically three times more successful at achieving the outcome, but there are three times as many women attempting the same outcome. So as, 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 as valuable and important as it is for our organisations and all of the other organisations that are working in this space, for the work that they do, we've got this exponentially growing number of people who are really struggling, who are living with mental health conditions, who are in crisis, who are either thinking about hurting themselves or they are tragically hurting themselves. If we do not approach this in a fundamentally different way, we will not and we cannot realistically expect the numbers to come down. 
And to overlay all of that is this. 2019, we had a Royal Commission into the Victorian mental health sector in our state. I was invited to be a witness um, in the Royal Commission. The commissioners who were charged with this report, uh, this, this uh, Royal Commission, found three key, um, uh, reported three key findings of the consultation and the commission report. Um, and that was that demand had outstripped supply. Simplifying that, there's not enough resources or services to cope with the increasing number of people who need support. Number two, that the system was, was not serving and in actual fact was failing the people who needed professional support and their, and their families. And number three, that there's an over-reliance on medication. This is pre-COVID. You now overlay the impact of COVID on a system which was fundamentally broken, flawed, under-resourced and underfunded. With the impact of COVID, we now have a separate epidemic. And I'm not saying that to be um, sensationalistic. I'm not saying that to dramatise it. This is the reality of what we're living through. We, have, we now have a system which cannot cope. We have um, examples of uh, um, psychologists and psychiatrists not able to take on any new patients until 2022. And in some, in some cases, the only thing the psychiatrist can do is medicate somebody because they don't have any available time to work with them professionally. We have a system which is under-resourced, underfunded, broken, systematically flawed, and as reported by the commissions, potentially contributing to some of the negative experiences of the people in the system. So the point I'm making is that we've, we, we've got COVID. I acknowledge that. And that's a real issue. But we've got a bigger issue. And the issue is the impact of lockdowns and restriction, restrictions on the mental health and emotional well-being of a significantly larger population or percentage of the population, not only in our state, but around the country. And this is an issue that's not going to go away unless we approach it differently. Absolutely, mate. Yeah, couldn't uh, couldn't agree with you more. And it's, um, you know, obviously we're, we're from Ballarat and we see these, um, you know, regional numbers as well, regional suicide rates and um, and self-harm and, and, um, and numbers like that are just skyrocketing through the roof. And we we recently did a, a, a tour up to New South Wales around regional New South Wales and uh, the, the, the conversations and the um, the issues around those communities whether it be farmland, you know, farms up there that are in drought, then fire, then floods, and and again, this is this is all pre-COVID, um, and not being able to get those resources that you might find in the cities, and um, you know, there's obviously a lot of incredible organisations out there, but d just the d the simplicity of being able to go and see a psychologist or a psychiatrist, and and not have to wait for that, you know, t until 2022, and and having those resources available, and and whether it be online or in person. Um, and having that support network wherever we are in Australia, um, we found that's been a massive issue that we've seen, especially in regional. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's sort of trying to uh, create this blanket effect around Australia where people are able to access this assistance and this help and, and these organisations um, and, and being able to follow up with that as well. And, you know, as I've actually heard in uh, one of your uh, one of your talks this morning. Um, you know, mental health is is something that you you live with for, for the rest of your life. You know, it's something that you um, are day by day experiencing and um, and uh, you know are dealing with. And it's something that we we can't just say, "Well, this will be over." Like COVID, you know, we we can sort of see a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, you know, whether it be this year, next year, the year after. Um, but with mental health, it's going to be around here for the next 5, 10, 20, 150 years. So it's about working something around that we can look after all Australians, um, not only for the next six months, next 12 months, but something that we can create that is going to save more people's lives. Yeah, look, I agree with all of that, Sean. I agree with the impact and the challenges that uh, people in regional and rural parts of Australia live with on a daily basis. But mental health will exist as long as there's a human species because every person has it. And this is something that we are very deliberately trying to challenge individuals, communities, and our society is that 
everybody, what everybody that woke up today in Australia, irrespective of where they live, what they do, their gender, their age, their religious, religious beliefs, and their life experiences. It's irrelevant. The one common denominator that links us all together is that we all woke up this morning with mental health. The only point of difference between you and I and anybody else is where is our mental health on the spectrum? So our message, our mantra with Pucker Up is we don't work, we don't work in the crisis space. It's a really noisy, busy, loud environment. And that's not to be critical of anyone or any organisation that's in that space. But here's the problematic nature of the way that we've set up our system in Australia historically. One of two things happens. One, if you're like me, you wait until you become really unwell before you recognise something's wrong. And then you start to think about what can I do? And for a lot of people, that's often too late. Or secondly, the system is set up to, to intervene when there's a crisis. So there are examples, again, captured in the Royal Commission, where people were not admitted, people are not being admitted because they're not deemed sick enough. These people could be at risk of hurting themselves, but if they don't meet the criteria to be admitted, they're being sent back into the communities. That's, that's, that's a failing of a basic human right. And we don't, as, as, a, as an organisation, we don't want to work in that space. We don't think that's going to change anything. So what we've very deliberately and strategically done as an organisation, which is why we've partnered with Melbourne University, Centre for Wellbeing Science and ELPI, is that we are positioning ourselves up the very other end, the opposite end to crisis, and that is preventative education. So Melbourne Uni and the Centre for Wellbeing Science have uh, been working in the field of positive psychology. They're a global, globally recognised leader in the, probably the top two or three organisations, research organisations around the world in the area of positive psychology. So we partner with them because they bring the science, the evidence and the research that underpins our programs. We then translate that so that it's available for, in the first instance, corporate Australia. And our whole mission, Sean, our vision with Parker Up is to end suicide. It's always been our vision since day one and I won't apologise for it. But our vision, ending suicide, is an outcome of the actions that we do. And the actions that we're doing is educating people with the evidence-based science-backed content, which helps people develop an understanding of their own well-being and mental health, develop a skill set and their own toolbox, which empowers them to look after their mental health. And what underpins this decision-making is the stat that a lot of people have heard. One in five people will live with a mental health condition in any 12-month period during their life. So 20% of the population right now are living with these conditions. What are we doing with the other 80% to keep them healthy? That's Pucker Up's focus. We want to give people the education and the toolbox that keeps people healthy in the first place, which means they don't need to rely on the well-being, the mental health sector, which is not working in the first place. Staying healthy is a short, medium and long-term outcome and benefit which is much better for the individual and the community um, in regard, as opposed to getting unwell and trying to find an avenue into a system which is not able to serve the community it's created to serve. I love it. That's, um, it it's, it's such a um, completely different outlook on, on the entire sector. Um, and I'm actually really glad you, you, you really explain that because you, you do look at different organizations around and and you're right it is it is a um you know predominantly a crisis resources that you do see um and to sort of look at the other other end of the spectrum and look at that other 80 percent like you just said um those other 80 percent the people that may not be experiencing mental health issues and and except for waiting for them to experience it practicing teaching Good mental health practices, et cetera, et cetera, before that gets to a uh, gets to a point. So that's that's incredible. It's a it's 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 similar, and I appreciate that. It's it, it is you don't just hop in a manual car at the age of seventeen or sixteen, and know how to use the clutch and the gears and the brake levers and the and the, and the blinkers and the wipers and the steering wheel, all that. You have to learn the skills. This is what we're doing. Our, I, I have a vehicle. You have a vehicle. I'm not talking about the car you own. 
My vehicle is my body and my mind. It's the same for you. So we want to give people, we want to give people the driving lessons that allows them to develop the confidence and the skill set to be able to drive and use their vehicle effectively, proactively, and preventatively. And if I add one other thing into that, people don't consciously make decisions to impact their physical health. That makes no sense. We don't want to get sick. We don't want to break down and we don't want to die any sooner than we have to if we have a choice. So we understand we need to look after our physical health. But when we think about health, one of our other messages is health is the combination of physical plus emotion, physical plus mental health. If we look after our physical health, it, it makes perfect sense to us that we start to give people the tools to look after their mental health. And if we can do that, we are going to keep people healthy. If we can do that, we're going to keep people out of the system. And if we do that and we do it well, we are going to prevent people from ending their lives. And that's the only reason Pucker Up exists. And I, I, I desperately hope that we can close the doors on Pucker Up in my lifetime. Because if we can do that, we've achieved our vision. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, absolutely, mate. That's incredible. And talk, talk to me about the, the uh, Pucker Up bike ride. So um, that's in a, in a couple of weeks, in uh, or a couple of months, sorry. No, a couple of months. A, November. Yep. Um, so tell us all about that. So uh, look, the background to all of that is that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a my form of exercise is cycling. Um, and and I, love, I love the sport for a lot of reasons. It's my, it's my number one go-to um, exercise tool that helps me manage my mental health and emotional well-being. And I've been doing this for 15 years. But the, 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 there's a couple of reasons as to why this is an important, this is an important um, event. For me, Sean, cycling is one of the great metaphors for life. And I don't know if you've done any cycling, but when you're cycling in a group, say you've got 10, 15, 20 people in a group, you're out and, you, and you're all on a ride. Whether you know people well or not, you have a responsibility to pay attention to the group because everybody's safety and your safety is paramount. And when, when, you, when you pay attention and when you've ridden for a while, you can start to identify and pick up the heads dropped a bit, starting to breathe a bit heavier. Somebody's just dropping off the back of the group or they're not able to roll through the front and do a turn on the front. They're starting to sweat a lot more. They've stopped talking. There's just some subtle signs that somebody's starting to struggle or they're having a bad day on the bike. When you identify that, you can go over to that person during the, during the ride and go, hey, are you okay? What do you need? Everything all right? Do you need us to back the speed off a bit within the group? We've got a break in 5Ks. Can, can we get you there? Do you want some water? Do you want some food? Do you want to push? Do you want us to push you slightly on the back? Do you want to stop? Or if somebody's out the back, grab a couple of mates and roll back, pick them up, drag them back. So there's this natural care and empathy when you're riding a bike to help someone who's going through a difficult day. That's exactly what we can do with um, people that we care about in life. When we know what to look for, when we're attentive enough to pay attention, hey, somebody looks a little bit off today. They're a bit quiet. They're not responding to my texts, my emails, my phone calls, my, my WhatsApp messages. They're normally online on time for a weekly webinar. They're not online. They're actually taking time off. Um, that doesn't mean that somebody's got a mental health condition, but it could be a subtle sign that somebody's really starting to struggle. So just like on the bike in life, we can go, hey, is everything okay? Do you want to have a chat? Is there anything you'd like to talk to me about? What can I do to help, help you right now? What do you need from me to help you right now? And this is why cycling is really important. And I think a great reflective metaphor for life. You do the same thing on the bike as you do it in life. We look out for each other and we help one another without needing to be the experts. So that's, 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 that's the sort of context as to why cycling is a great representative um, uh, exercise um, and a message that we're trying to, uh, communic trying to communicate to a lot of other people. Um, from a strategic business perspective, um, we've spent the past 14 months working really closely with Melbourne University and the Centre for Wellbeing Science to design foundations of wellbeing. It's now um, being delivered uh, with two amazing corporate partners, Reese Plumbing, um, 652 sites across the country, and a large McDonald's franchise here in Melbourne. Pardon me. And they have 12 stores, 1,300 people between the age of 17 and uh, 30 working across their stores. 
um, with the potential of if this program is successful, then McDonald's are looking at the possibility of being rolled, this being rolled out to their stores nationally. And that's a significant opportunity for us. But in, in order for us to be in a position to make foundations of wellbeing available to every business in every industry of any size here in Australia, we need to raise a significant amount of funding in order to be able to reinvest all of that money into the preparation, the planning, and the ultimate rollout of foundations of wellbeing. Um, so we uh, are um, eight weeks into um, selling the bike drive. So there's two options. There's corporate sponsorship, the rider come on. Um, we've sold it out, which is in the middle of a pandemic, just an extraordinary response. Incredibly grateful for all our corporate partners to get on board. Um, and then the second option is for individuals who feel passionate about suicide prevention. Can't join corporate ride. to jump on board a funds for Pucker Up. So the event is about a conversation. The event is about suicide prevention. The event is about raising vital funds that allow us to then roll our program out. And we would hope that our program is in every workplace across the country in the coming years. Um, and it is about educating employees and employers so that they can support their staff and each other to look after their mental health and emotional well-being in the workplace. Because we've got businesses that are now working remotely. We've got businesses that have hybrid working arrangements, sometimes in the office, sometimes from home. We've got uh, the ongoing issue of absenteeism, so people not able to work because of mental health issues. We've got the issue of presenteeism, which is the loss of productivity because people are living with these conditions or are incredibly stressed, and that's impacting their ability to do their job that they're paid to do. Uh, the World Health Organization two years ago uh, acknowledged and recognized that work-related stress is a new phenomenon. So, so we've got businesses who are, are, are dealing with a myriad of, of, of different unique challenges now, and then put COVID into all of that, that's having an impact on the, the well-being of their staff. So we want to work with businesses to help their staff. And we believe the program gives a business a great opportunity to address absenteeism, presenteeism, uh, loss of productivity. It also helps with recruiting good people. It also helps retaining good staff. It also helps with creating a fantastic workplace culture. And the end result for businesses is that's reflected across the triple bottom line. Happier, healthy, more productive people help a business become more profitable. And our greatest assets, our most valuable resource are not the products or the services we sell as businesses, they're our people. And I've, I've worked in this space for 15 years and I have, I have constantly run into the same barriers. Cost, not important, we've got it under control. Well, one of the benefits of a pandemic that set business businesses on their backside and they now know this stuff's real. Now they're coming to us going, what can we do? So we're going to look at this opportunity um, and, and, and we've worked incredibly hard to get to this position. And I know that this is a long-winded answer for you, Sean. I apologize for that. No, but we right. have purpose-built our program off the back of interviewing 30 large companies in Australia to understand what the issues, challenges, barriers and risks that existed within these organizations that were preventing them from supporting and prioritizing the well-being of their people. So those valuable insights were used as a guiding framework that helped us create our program. So we've designed a program to meet the needs and the issues that businesses have shared with us. And that's why we think this is a really important but also exciting opportunity. And that's that's one of the reasons why we're doing the bike ride because we need the funding to be able to launch the program. Yeah, brilliant. So, you know, a lot of evidence-based programming, which is um, which is obviously super important because we're able to reflect back on exactly what, you know, this space needs. And, and you know, as you said, the COVID pandemic is in relation to businesses. I think uh, we've had a few podcasts about this where it's, um, it's really put all businesses on notice and it has put it, you know, everyone on their ass essentially. And um, they've, they've had to sort of overlook exactly what they're doing, the employees and, and the mental health and the well-being of everyone else to, um, you know, get back up on their feet and, 
it's, it's something that we're going to be dealing with for a little bit longer with the um, with the COVID as well. So that's uh, the, the evidence based programming is is really really great stuff. Um, if I could ride a bike, I, I tra- trained for a triathlon last year, mate, and I came off the bike <laughs> three times. Um, <laughs> so I'll um, yeah. I might have to get back on the bike and give it Done a crack that. because I love the yeah, I love the um, I love the uh, the sort of metaphorical background behind cycling. That's really really great. That sort of I sort of find that myself with um, you know even with playing footy and um, you know just sort of uh, you know whether it might be going to the gym or going for a run with a few mates. Um, you know what, as you sort of explain that, I could sort of reflect back on things that I do with a few mates of mine and. And it is the same sort of thing, you know, just when your mates, um, you know, a little bit quieter or not pushing as much as they normally would, um, you know, sometimes late to footy training, late to a game, all that sort of stuff. And you can sort of start to think about these things, about reflecting on, on you know, if they're just having a bad day or whether you need to sort of check in with them and, and, and make sure they're doing okay and, and, um, and really start that conversation and that sort of united sort of front to, to get on the front foot of things. So that's, um, that's really terrific. Thank you. Uh, so I wanted to um, I wanted to chat about um, a, a guy that uh, was obviously a great friend of yours, um, and being from from Ballarat as well, he he had a massive impact on, on our city. And I was um, I was lucky enough to to meet him a few times as well. And that's Danny Spadafrawley, and um, obviously a, a very very tragic loss a couple of years ago uh, with, with Spud. And I uh, I was watching your uh, your speech at his uh, his funeral this morning and. Got to be honest, mate. It brought me to tears that the the things that you were saying, the 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 importance of the um the conversation that you were talking about was really really prominent and completely relatable to not only everything back then a few years ago, but everything right now and the importance of um, men, women, you know, if they are struggling to seek that help and to work on yourself as well. And um, you know, you, you went into you working on yourself every single day for the last 20 odd years. Um, and I thought that was, that was such a powerful thing to say um, for people, not only in the crowd, but obviously that was on Fox footy and people were able to witness that on YouTube now. But um, t- tell me about Spud. Obviously I, I met him, met him twice. Mm-hmm. He actually inspired me to, um, I, I heard him speak at a, uh, at an event down here at North Barrett footy club. And I was just about to make a decision um, that was uh, pretty much going to put my career in a completely different um, avenue. And and I was at this event and uh, I had no idea what I was going to do. And Spud got up and talked for about half an hour. And as soon as he got off stage, I went and called uh, called this real estate agent. I said, all right, let's do it. Let's go ahead. I'll sign the contracts. And uh, and then we opened a new gym about two months after. So he really did inspire me to to open that gym. Um, just by the words that he said on the uh, on the day of this um, of this event. So, tell me about Spud. Obviously, we we knew he was a great footy player, great guy. Um, some of the stories I heard on uh, from from Jason Dunstall this morning on on um, you know his mm. uh, his larrikancy and his his pranks and all that sort of stuff. But how much did it impact did did he have on on continuing this conversation, continuing pucker up for you? Oh, look, the first thing I'd say, Sean, is I loved him unconditionally. I just loved him. Um, he's, he was a great friend. He was a great supporter. He was a mate. He was a colleague. He was the funniest AFL media performer I've ever seen and known. He talked to Gary Lyon, Jason Dunstall, James Brayshaw, Brian Taylor. Spud had this uncanny ability, self-deprecating way of just bringing so much laughter and light to a broadcast on a Saturday afternoon. And the thing, I worked a lot with Spud um, in the AFL media. And the thing, the thing, he was, he was, he was a, he was a middle-aged man that behaved like a childish child. <laughs> and we'd be in the commentary box and we'd, we'd be on air and he'd go to tell me something. And I'd just give a little chortle, like a little. And if he, if he heard that, that was all he needed. And he'd go and he, he'd go for 10 or 15 minutes. We'd have the producer in the background going, got to go for a break, got to get our sponsor plugs away. Spud's laughing. I'm crying. The more I laughed and I cried, the more he laughed and he cried. But there was just this really infectious nature about him. He was a, he was a big country lad, big personality. And the, the, the comment that I, I heard 
a, so almost to a person um, for a, a quite a while after Sud, a Spud's uh, passing, I had complete strangers walk up and said, you know, I never met him, but I felt like I knew him. I don't believe Spud knew or appreciated the universal love that people had for him. And they were people that knew him and, and complete strangers. He was a massive personality, a tough football player, a wonderful loyal teammate, and even um, uh, more wonderful and loyal person. And, and I, um, it, it, it's a massive loss. I think about him often. I was thinking about him last week. Um, for, there are times where he just comes into my head and, and I can, you know, I, I, I cry sometimes um, when I think about it. There are other times where I laugh. Other times I'm shaking my head going, did we really do that? Did he really say that? So I've got, I've got great memories of it. But the thing that I admire the most, I, I've never shared this story. Um, and there's only, there's only three other people that know this story. And, and about 15 years ago, I'd already come out publicly and, and talked about my own experiences. Spud picked me up um, uh, in Melbourne with my dad and a cousin of his. And we had to drive down to Warrnambool. We had a, a speaking engagement. It was either with the Hampton Footy League or the Warrnambool, Warrnambool District Football League. And it was a grand final day. So Spud and I had to go down there and do a talk together. And I was in the front. Spud was driving a uh, beat up old bloody Nissan Patrol my old man was in the back and his cousin was in the back. And I remember vividly that Spud opened up this conversation with something along the lines of, hey, hey, Swatter, I, I don't really understand this, but I know you do. I've got a niece who's really struggling. I don't get mental health. I never have got it. I don't understand it. Help me. Help me understand that. So we had a very, um, what would I say? It, it, was, it, was, it was a conversation, but it was more me talking to Spud about some things that, you know, I, I've learned and why it's important to support networks to, you know, support people without judging them. Conversation might have gone for 10 or 15 minutes, and that was it. Never talked about it again until he rang me up out of the blue one day and told me that he was um, really struggling with his own mental health challenges. So I share that because it, 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 it reinforces my belief that you can, you, you can be, and this is not to be critical of you, you can be uneducated or maybe a little ignorant and have never lived with mental health conditions. And then fast forward 5, 10, 15 years down the track and absolutely understand the nature the challenges that come with these conditions because you're living it. And I can recall times where I can recall one game, he and I were both walking, working with Triple M. I'm at the SCG getting ready to call a Swans game. Spuds at the MCG with BT, JB, Gary Lyon in the commentary box doing a post show until six o'clock when we take the podcast. And about 5.30, he texts me, he goes, can I talk? Can I talk? And this is while he's on air. So I said, yeah, mate, when you're in the next ad break, give me a call, talk to me, what's going on? Um, he rang me up, he goes, mate, I can't, I can't do this. I don't know how to do this. I can't, I can't, I can't see a way of getting through this. So um, he, I feel very fortunate, Sean. I, I, I feel incredibly fortunate that he trusted me to talk. And we talked a lot. We talked, we talked a lot. And um, I saw the work that he put in um, and I, I feel very fortunate that I was trusted enough to be one of his key support people through that first round of um, his battle. And I, I saw how deep a hole he was in. Yet this bloke, as hard as it was for him, found a way to get back up out of that hole and turn that experience into wanting to help other people. Um, you talked about, you know, the time that you saw him speak. One of the great, you know, you want the definition of courage. Courage comes on the footy field. But courage, real courage, is the commitment to continue to help other people when you are hurting yourself. And Danny did this up until the day he passed. And that's courage for me. I will never forget him. Uh, I'll love him for as long as I'm alive. I miss him greatly. I think about him often. Um, 
And I um, am committed to making sure that we may have lost that battle, but we won't lose the war. And that, I said that at his eulogy. And, um, you know, he, he was he was someone that you just, you don't replace and you don't forget. And um, his legacy uh, will hopefully live on uh, for a very, very long time. Um, and hopefully what he did while he was alive had a positive and life-changing impact on a number of people. I've got no doubt it did. Absolutely, it did, mate. Yeah, he's, he's left a... A definite, uh, a definite legacy in a lot of people, whether it be on the footy field, footy fans, um, or just in general. It was, um, it, it's, it's just, uh, a, you know, we, we often talk about here at, um, at Shaka with just the, the little stuff he does, the conversations he started, um, and the effect he's had, you know, especially in the Ballarat Bungaree area here. Um, he's, he's definitely one of the, the Ballarat sons that, you know, everyone, every sort of local. We'll, uh, we'll never forget, absolutely. Mate, going, you know, going into um, the next sort of 5, 10, 15 years, you've obviously spoken about um, what Pucker Up wants to do um, or are doing, not wants to, are doing with, uh, with Melbourne University. What do you personally want to see, uh, not through just, just Pucker Up, but the entire mental health um, you know, realm in the next five, 10 years, whether it be, um, you know, what you're doing with the organisation or Australian, uh, Australia as a sort of generalisation, what, what are you sort of hoping to see in the next five, 10 years? What I'd like to see is a fundamental seismic shift away from crisis as a, as a community, as a society and as a mental health sector and um, Australian population. I want us to move the horse and cart up the other end. I want to work. I want our focus to be on prevention, on maintaining good health, on equipping people with the confidence, the skill set, the tools, um, and the environments everywhere at home, at work, at a footy club, netball club, in the office, wherever we go, within a schoolyard environment that empowers people to talk openly and honestly about good mental health and emotional well being. I want stigma to be completely abolished. I want discrimination to be a chargeable offence, which it is in some regards. But I want all of these barriers removed and we create a new frontier, a frontier that gives all of us the ability and the opportunity of talking about stress, mental health, both good and bad, being able to put our hand up or hand out when we need that support, being able to put our hand around, our hand over or our hand out to somebody else who needs that support. Um, and bringing the outlier when you think about health, which it is, is mental health. It sits out outside of the general health um, conversation. It needs to be brought back in and brought back in very quickly. And it needs to be included in the health discussion and the way that governments invest into health. 3% of the national budget goes into mental health. 3%. The total national budget, state and federal, 3%. It's, it's farcical and it's simply not good enough. So I, I want to move away from crisis and reacting and intervening when people are sick to creating an environment and a country where we keep people healthy. And I think that the best way to do that, the only genuine way to do that is through education. We teach our kids to walk. We teach our kids to eat. We teach our kids to exercise. Well, let's drop something else in there. Let's teach our kids, the future generations of mums and dads and business owners, teachers, role models, um, uh, people that will drive our country forward. Let's teach that generation how to look after their mental health and emotional well-being. Um, and if we can do that, then we will, we will achieve a generational change. But until we do that, then we're going we're gonna to see the same things happen, unfortunately. Yeah, fantastic answer, mate. Completely agree. Um, I've got two more questions. One's a good one. One's, um, well, they're both... I think they're both good ones. Uh, first one is, uh, how do you want to be remembered? Oh. I know it's a tough one. <laughs> uh, look, it's up to other people how they're going to remember me. I just, it, it, would, it would be nice. I won't be here to know, <laughs> but it would be nice if people, when they thought of me, knew that I cared. Yep. He's someone that cared. Yep. 
I think I think that's uh, that's pretty accurate, mate. And the final, mate, what, final uh, final question, mate. Who is winning the uh, the premiership this year? <laughs> oh God! <laughs> Who's your tip? Oh, you know, um, <laughs> I worked in the media for seventeen years, and I finished uh, at the end of two thousand nineteen. I don't watch any footy. <laughs> I do not. I do not watch any footy. Um, this is probably not going to be an okay answer, but. Um, one of my daughters barracks for Sydney, they're in the eight. One of my daughters barracks for Geelong, they're in the eight. My son barracks for West Coast, they're just outside the eight. If one of those three teams win, I'm going to be happy because one of my kids will be happy. Marta, look, I, I, th- I think in all seriousness, I'd love to see Melbourne win given the fact that they haven't won for a very, very long time. They, they, they've had a great year. It's been a, a long time between drinks. You know, I thought it was magnificent when Sydney won their first premiership in over 70 years. Um, you know, I think it would be another fairy tale story if Melbourne could do that. Um, at the end of the day, given the season that they're having to navigate, it, it'll come down to the, the two teams that play on grand final day and the team that has the best day will win the game of footy. Simple as that. Absolutely, mate. I'm a, uh, I'm a Western Bulldog supporter, so... I'm, uh, I'm I'm quietly sort of want Melbourne to get up as well because I know what it was like back in 2016. But yeah, um, true. obviously, you know, if yeah. it's if it's against us, I know exactly what way I want it to go. <laughs> so, mate, thank you so much for your chat today. I've really appreciated it. Um, all your insights, everything you're doing with Pucker Up and through the um, through mental health, it's been absolutely incredible. I know people love this episode. Um, thank you for doing what you're doing and continue. It. It's uh, it's it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I. I appreciate it, Sean. I appreciate the opportunity to just have a conversation with you. Um, Thank you for that. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank you and your organisation and everybody involved, but not only that, the community that follow you, you've built up a really big community. I want to acknowledge and thank you for for doing what you guys are doing and girls are doing because it's incredibly important. Um, It's never been more important. So thank you from uh, me and us to you guys. Keep doing what you're doing and Hopefully, once we get out of this madness, we can eventually cross paths um, and be warned, mate. I'm a massive hugger. So I love uh, it. there might be a big hug coming your way when we do eventually get to meet each other. So thank you. Oh, great. Thanks so much, mate. Have a great day. No, no problems. You too.